I get up early and go down to the pier a couple times a week. I feel like my heart and mind are the most alert early in the morning and all the normal chaos of life hasn't quite started yet. And so it, it allows me to just simply spend time with my God. I started really following my heart's calling at Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara when I came alive in Christ. I was the janitor, worked for the church for about six and a half years, and then they sent me to Vail, Colorado of all places to start a church. After 20 years of God doing great things in Vail, Colorado, he moved me back right here to my hometown and allows me now to be the senior pastor at Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara. My hope for this morning show is that we'll be able to reach folks right in their home in the time of great need. And so I love the idea of us bringing some life and some love and some hope right into living rooms and, and homes in our city. Welcome. We're so thankful that you're joining us. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about prayer. I'm going to be looking actually at the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you already know it. Maybe you know it right off the bat, right off the tip of your tongue, you can say it. But today we're going to be taking a look into that and the pattern of prayer. Pastor Adam Kappa, who's our worship leader, who starts us off with song, he's written a song uh, with the Lord's Prayer in it. And so as he leads this song, would you just let your heart be prepared for what God has in store for us in the Word? Again, I'm thankful that you're joining us. And now let's go to Adam. Good morning. Today, Pastor Tommy is going to be walking us through the Lord's Prayer, which is the way that Jesus taught us to pray. And so I put a melody to it, and we're going to sing it as well. This is the Lord's Prayer.
Thank you so much, Adam. I love that song. Wrapped up in the lyrics of that song are really words from the Bible, which is so fantastic. The Lord's Prayer. I, I love how many people, when you ask them, do you know the Lord's Prayer? They say, oh, I know it. They've heard it somewhere, or they know it by rote. They can quickly uh, just have it flow right off of the lips. They said, oh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debtors as we forgive those who debt against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us even for thy kingdom, power and glory forever. Amen. And they say it just like that. And the crazy thing about it is that Jesus' intention for this pattern of prayer was not so that it just would roll off your tongue fast or that it would be something by rote, just stamped in your heart, but that we'd actually have firm foundation for our feet. Now imagine speaking to your wife or to your loved one in such a manner that you just instantly said, uh, Hi, honey, it's so great to see you. Hey, listen, if you could go ahead and give me some bread, and then when you're done serving dinner, it'd be really great if later we could do some dancing or something like this, and forgive the neighbors because next door they're really kind of lame, and then that would be really great if we could do laundry, and then it's all done. Okay, thank you. Amen. Bye. And then that was the last time you talked to your wife or your spouse for the whole evening. Uh, imagine how that relationship would go. Well, it wouldn't be very good, right? First off, you're like, wait, did you ask me to bake you bread and do the laundry? What's going on here? Right? But so often, I think we think of prayer in that manner. We just go, if I can just get it out quick, to God, just let it roll off my lips and, and get it before him, then somehow magically, he's gonna go, oh, great, that sounds perfect. I'll do all of those things for you and more. You know, the reality of God is this, he's personal, he's intimate. He longs for a relationship with you and me. He doesn't want just surfaced word talks, but he, he, he wants to have intimate encounter with us. And so when Jesus was sharing with his disciples on how to pray, they had seen before them people praying religiously. He saw those who had many glorious words rolling off of their tongue with a sense and an air of authority and religious power, right? And, and he would point them out and say, "What? look at this guy standing on the street corners. He thinks he's heard by his many words. Maybe they weren't spoken as fastly as I was speaking there, but repetitive over and over and over that somehow that was going to do it. More than anything, the religious leader was wanting to be seen for standing there saying, look at me, I now am praying and I'm continuing to pray and I don't even know what I'm praying, but I'm praying. And Jesus said, look, th that's, not, that's not how you should pray. He pointed out those who had show about their prayer or were just quick in it or thought it somehow it was a, 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 a magic tool to unlock these blessings that come from God. And he said, you know what? When you guys pray, do it differently. And go into your room and close the door where no one can see. And then there in that intimate place where you're before your father in heaven, pray. And your father who sees you in secret, will reward you openly. He says he'll meet you there. He'll bless you there in that place of prayer. Then Jesus gave him this prayer. He, he, he didn't say, I want you to pray this way. He said in verse 9 of chapter 6, he said, in this manner, therefore pray. He said, I'm going to give you a framework so that your heart knows how to be set apart before God. Again, again not, not by works, not by some magical posture, but to say, hey, when we're talking to God, here's a way we approach our king. Here's things to keep in mind as you're praying. And so the very first thing that Jesus said should be part of our prayer is our Father who art in heaven. He, he identifies where the Father of all creation is located, right? Wh where he is and what he's up to. The author of life, right? The one who fashioned the world, the one who made them, their inside, right? Knows that every hair on their head. Our Father, he's in heaven. He's, he's above all and over all. You know, nothing is more powerful than when you and I are alert to who we're talking to. Now, the word that's used here in the text is powerful, Father, Abba. It, it really denotes an intimacy with God. Not somehow that he, he is a distant relative of someone we can't quite know, but we know they have authority, and so we got to be kind of you know, fearful of them. N no, it's more of the pressing into the, the Father, the Abba, the Daddy's heart, and saying, God, you above my dad, above all things who love me. It's you I'm seeking. So, so look with me at John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, 
To them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In John's gospel, he proclaims our relationship with God the Father. And listen, if we're going to talk to the God of all creation, we need to know that relationship. And if we've asked God to be our king and, and asked Jesus to be our personal savior, well, then we're seen as children of the Most High. Not, not by some law or some rule, but by the spiritual work that God does in redeeming us and making us his own. And so there's power in prayer. And Jesus said, as you start your prayer, understand who you're speaking to. Your Abba, your Father who is in heaven and who is above all. He then uses this phrase, which I think is fantastic, hallowed, hallowed be your name. You see, there's a lot wrapped up in names and all through the word of God, we, we see this very clearly. And in the Jewish culture, the name represented so much more than just simply, hey, how to call somebody from the field. Hey, Johnny, come in. No, it was way more than that, right? It had, it had character and heart and hope and, and it, it spoke of the fullness of the ones whose name you were using. And so by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Wrapped up in your name is the fullness of your character. You are Jehovah Rapha. You're the healer. You're the author and the finisher of my faith. You are the great I am before all things. And the fullness of his name should be reverenced by us. Now, if you think about that in today's society, God's name is not used correctly very often. So often it's used as a slang word or a curse word for that matter, and it's thrown out haphazardly. In fact, even after I say this to you, you watch how often today you'll hear someone say God's name without saying, oh, it's hallowed. It's set apart above all else. It, it means literally to render or pronounce something as holy. So when we enter into prayer, we know who we're talking to, our Father who loves us, loves, loves, loves us, sees us as his children. And we pronounce, you, Father, are holy. You're above all. Your name is holy and meant to be hallowed in my own heart. I, I, I challenge you this week. Be careful when Jesus' name is on your lips. Use it in such a manner that you pronounce his holiness and see what happens in your own heart. It's mind-blowing, the change that happens. And in fact, I remember that early on when I became a follower of Jesus, when I became a Christian. All of a sudden, I realized how easily I'd throw his name out without power behind it. And in fact, in the wrong ways. And all of a sudden, it, it stuck in my heart. And I realized, wait, this is my God who is holy, who loves me, who's actually, actually interested in, a communi in communication with me. Now, the prayer goes on like this, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here Jesus gets our heart in the understanding the right dynamic about what God is doing. He says, look, you have to be able to understand that God's plans are bigger than your plans. So as we seek God in prayer, we know his name and that he's our father. But are we also aware that his whole plan, his kingdom, is much different than the kingdom we live in. And are we urgent and excited about what type of dynamic he wants to bring into this world, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Romans chapter 12, verse two. Paul says this as he challenges the church in Rome. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? See, it's not a matter of somehow fixing all the kingdoms here on earth, right? Doing something our own way. It's about asking for God's kingdom to be present here with us. In my marriage, in my family, in my relationships with others. God, I want you to rule my heart. Because if God the Father, whose name is hallowed, is ruling my heart, chances are I'm going to act in love. I'm going to love, love, love. I'm going to do that. That's what's going to happen. And so when we seek God in prayer, we got to get those things right, who we're talking to, the holiness of his name, and that we want his heart over our heart, his ways over our ways, his kingdom done right here. Imagine what would take place if the kingdom principles, uh, what's happening in the kingdom of heaven were happening right here 
on planet Earth with us now. Galatians chapter 1 verse 3 says this, Grace to you, Paul says, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, so Paul's point here is he's saying, listen, it is God himself who delivered us through Jesus Christ from this world. But isn't this world where all of our troubles are, right? We deal with the trial of the season. We deal with the frustration and brokenness that's all around us. And so we want somehow to fix it with our own understanding. And Jesus says, no, seek the one who transforms the situation, who changes your perspective in the midst of the trial, who gives you a heavenly perspective towards an earthly trial. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, God, as it is in heaven. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, you know what's so beautiful about this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples? And again, he was teaching them a pattern of prayer. He says, come to your Father who loves you, who's redeemed you, and ask him for normal stuff. He knows we have need of it. He's just looking for our hearts to be yielded to say, God, would you today provide for me what my body needs? Would you just give me sustenance for this day? Provide for me today my daily bread. Now, what it also teaches us is that Jesus didn't say, when we seek God, we should say, God, could you give me the next 35 years of bread in advance so I could have a nice storehouse and I could do this and do that and do these things like that? It wasn't this idea of, of give me the grandeur of all you possibly can, possibly can give me. He says, get your heart right and understand that today, tomorrow's not even promised. And so by seeking God and saying, God, today, will you give me my daily bread? Not, not, not months from now, not weeks, weeks provision, just today. May I be satisfied with you giving me air in my lungs and a heart that's beating, a mind that's working, that I today may be satisfied by your provision. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, would challenge all who are listening that we often worry far too much about what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, right? Our rising up and our lying down. He says, here's what you do. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and then all these things will be added to you. Your father has it. S- something happens and changes in my, the dynamic when I know who I'm talking to, that his name is, is hallowed, that it's his kingdom I want, and, and by the way, w- provide for me this day that which you have for me, my daily bread. Now he goes on to say, and forgive, um, forgive us our debts as we forgive those our, or our debtors. Maybe you know it as forgive us our trespasses as, the, as we forgive those who trespassed against us. This, the idea is the same. He's saying, listen, those places that are broken in my life, those places that I've trespassed on others or I am in debt to because I have hurt them or I've broken or whatever it may be in your life, the, the, the challenge is to come to God and say, God, would you clean and forgive my heart? Would you literally wash me clean of what took place earlier in the day or maybe yesterday, maybe the condition of my mind, transform it, renew it, that I might have this fresh perspective for your kingdom this day. Forgive me of them. And then he says, as God, you give me strength to forgive those who have done the same to me. The reality is all of us have people in our life that have hurt us or circumstances that have been hard. Sometimes we feel like, well, I've been dealt a, uh, dealt a bad hand, you know, and th- this just hurts too much. It's just not fair. There's, there, there's these things that have come in the world that we have to deal with. And here Jesus says, seek God for the grace in your heart, the kingdom of heaven in your heart, so that you can forgive others just as you're asking to be forgiven. Doesn't it make sense? Jesus said, listen, if you can't forgive others, how do you expect me to forgive you? He he longs for us to have that heart. And I'm telling you, it's transforming in our prayer life and in our walk when we are asking God for grace and mercy and forgiveness, which he gives, and we're doing the same with those who have trespassed or have, have come against us in one manner or another. When we love the way God loves, try it today. You know that person that you just haven't been able to forgive. Try this day in prayer 
to set them before the Lord and say, God, I don't have the strength, but by your kingdom, your will being done, I know it's possible to forgive. Give me that love and then let me forgive and forgive me as I forgive others. And so he, he, he moves on to that personal spot. Ephesians chapter four, verse 32. Paul says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. There's a portion in Colossians uh, where P Paul uh, says this in, in chapter three, verse 12. He says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, gentleness, forgive one another, even as Christ has forgiven you, so you also should forgive one another. And then above all these things, put on the garment of love, which is the bond of peace. See, see Paul understood it. He said, guys, we gotta seek God first for, for that forgiveness and work in our heart and then do likewise as we're forgiving and gentle and thoughtful of the people that are around us. Now, in verse 13 of this prayer, he says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I remember as a kid when I'd pray this part, this part scared me. Oh, is God going to lead me into some crazy thing that's horrible or the devil for that matter, right? Lead me and then deliver me from the evil one. And I kind of mis misunderstood really what Jesus was saying here. First and foremost, God tempts no one. And we get this wrong all the time. Why would God tempt me in such a manner? And the reality is, no, that God, God didn't tempt you. It's, it's, it's understanding the word. So, see, the idea of temptation here is really testing, trial more so than it is temptation. The reality about any trial you have in your life, you can be tempted not to trust the kingdom of heaven, but to trust the earth, can't you? Right, we, we go through a trial and we're like, okay, I'm not gonna make it, I'm just gonna rely on my own understanding. Instead of saying, no, your kingdom come, your will be done. You've got your heart in the midst of this. And so trials in and of themselves can have opportunity for temptation. You and I can be tempted by the weakness of our flesh, or our, our, own, our own moral failures. We can, we can have this vulnerability that can cause us to lean on our own understanding instead of trust our God. And so in the prayer, it says, Lord, would you allow the trials to be in such a manner that I could endure through them? In fact, keep me from the lies of the enemy. Keep me from the evil one. Deliver me from his plans. Did you know that you have an adversary who'd love for you to, you to fail, would love for me to fail? It's just waiting for that trial to come to speak some sort of lie that we go, oh God, you're right, there's no hope. Where was God when I needed him, right? Lies, 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 lies. Here the prayer says, hey, I'm aware trials will come. Temptations will come. Deliver me from the evil one that I might see your kingdom come, Father, in the midst of this situation, providing and blessing and giving me power to forgive and power to walk according to your beautiful plan. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make way for an escape that you may be able to bear it. See, that's who God is. Paul knew that all too well. It's like, look, it's nothing new under the sun. And if you are talking to your father, who you know where he is in heaven, and his name is hallowed, right? And you're asking for his heart, his kingdom to be done right here on earth as it is in heaven. You're trusting him for your daily rising and lying and bread to give you forgiveness in your own heart and to share that for others, to lead you away from this and to keep you from the evil one. See, God will give you a way. He says, trust me, look to me. See if I don't meet you and strengthen you. Some of the craziest trials in my life have caused me to be on my knees longer and harder. And these, these moments of trials in my life I remember because they were the sweetest times of intimacy with the Father who loves me. And he'd hold me, encourage me to continue to walk, to make it through the thing that I was facing. And I have countless times that that's been the case in the midst of the trial, being right before my king, trusting him to lead me out. Now the prayer is powerful because it ends with, for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever and ever, amen. You see what Jesus was trying to teach us is to be just in awe of what God is up to, what he's capable of. So I don't 
We don't, I don't, all of our circumstances are different, but maybe today you just need to be reminded of who he is, the God of all creation, who loves you as a son or a daughter uh, if you've asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And in that brings power to forgive and power to provide and power to escape temptation and to move away from the devil's lives because he is the power and the glory forever and ever. Oh, I so love spending time with you in the Word of God. I, I, I pray that today your prayer life would go to a whole new level, not just quickly running through a prayer to say a prayer and be done, but to ask God to move in your heart, to change your, your understanding, transform your mind to the circumstance, and then to walk forward in power. That's what God wants for His family, that we'd be powerful, <laughs> that we'd have a love that was unstoppable, that we'd have a joy unspeakable, that we would just be over the top with power and life and living. God bless you. We love you. See you next week. Did you know that you have a loving God who desires to hear you, who desires to listen to you, not only when things are good and everything is great, but when things are hard, when you're going through struggles and you're uncertain about what's happening in culture. You have a God that wants to be with you. If you want to learn more about who this God is, you can listen to all the content we have on our website and on our social media. On Instagram, you can find us at Calvary SB, and on Facebook and YouTube, you can find us Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara. And we would love, love, love to have you join us on one of our Sunday morning services, either online or in person. So check out our website for that. And hey, if you're wondering what it's like on a Sunday morning, it's super fun. Here's a little sneak peek from the worship team. You know